I appreciate you joining us today. I am Diana Marzalek. I'm with Provoke Media, and we are here with our friends from Investus Digital for our discussion today. Um, we are here to discuss the importance of and what it takes to maximize your online presence. Um, we all know as communicators that that is uh, important in the best of times, but it's especially challenging as well as important now, given what we're all grappling with. Um, communicators in the PR industry are looking at how best to communicate around COVID-19, uh, challenges such as taking stands on solidarity and inclusion at a time of civil unrest, and we haven't even gotten yet to the presidential election, all of which um, is, is, makes a huge impact on the way we have our relationships with stakeholders and what stakeholders will think of us moving forward. Um, but communicators also have an advantage. Um, we think that at this time, digital communications give us a time to lead. They give us a time to connect with stakeholders while we're all distancing and um, find leadership that people aren't finding elsewhere, which is where Investus Digital comes in. Uh, Investus Digital has been in the forefront of digital communications for 20 years, helping corporate communicators, PR, invest pardon me, investor relations, and Marcoms around the world make the most of their online presence to connect with all audiences, from media and influencers to investors, employees, consumers, and society at large. Investus Digital has helped brands lead online with brands such as Rolls-Royce, De Beers, Anglo-American, and 1,600 others, to name a few. They're known for their IQ report, which have recently released the updated study for Connect IQ, and they're here to share the results of that study and to share how the leaders are doing it right. But first, we've got some housekeeping notes. We are lucky to have both video and slides here. So if participants, if you'd like to switch your view, you can find that feature in the top right. So you can have a mix and slide of slide and video content and follow along. If you have questions, please submit them through the Zoom chat. If you hover over your screen, you'll see that the chat feature in the toolbar and we will have um, about 20 minutes at the end for Q&A, but feel free to uh, submit them overall. So I'd like to introduce you to our friends from Invested Digital. We have Rachel Zahn and Luke Bishop, who I will turn the presentation over to. Thank you, Diana. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here with you guys today. Thank you very much for having us. Um, as for myself, I've been in the digital industry for about 17 years, both on the digital comm side, um, PR, and then performance marketing side. I've had the pleasure, privilege, and pain, if you will, and perseverance of working alongside our research and development team um, in updating our Connect IQ report, the one that you just mentioned that we've been um, running for about 10 plus years now and recently updated to fit these new digital standards. So I am very excited to wrap that up and share a lot of the data and insights with you guys today. Hi everyone. Yeah, um, just to reiterate what everyone said, thank you for um, taking time out of your busy schedules to uh, to join us. Hopefully, um, you know, we can uh, provide some useful information and definitely please do send in your, your Q&A. Obviously we've prepared, prepared this content um, in terms of what we think would be useful to you, but ultimately, you know, would be a miss if you walked away from this presentation after you know the next 45 minutes thinking that you didn't get anything out of it so you know please do send through you know, questions be great to, to answer those directly um my role at investors digital is vp of strategic growth uh, i've been working at investors digital for just over 10 years my role has always been to work with um, our clients listed on major stock exchanges to help them really communicate their brand values vision and purpose to their their global stakeholders, whether that be their investors, their employees, the media, etc. You know, working with uh, you know some of the the names that um, Diana mentioned during um, during the introduction there, like uh, Rolls Royce, One Eight Hundred Flowers, Apollo Global Management. So across all uh, all industries really, and, and looking for those common themes and trends to ensure that you know all companies uh, have the best chance to to communicate and succeed because that that's fundamentally what I believe in. I believe in you know transparent communications and. Um, you know the world sharing information as much as possible and hopefully you know all getting to to the same place in a, in a better world so um, hopefully we'll be able to cover off uh, that today and uh, give you all some useful insight and some takeaways in terms of you know what what to do you know moving forward regarding um, digital communications and uh, best practice and that's exactly what what we're covering uh, so we're going to be looking at the online presence uh, we've mentioned the Connect IQ report already, so obviously we're going to be talking um, about that in in some more detail. Um, 
And really this presentation is aimed at any professional communicators um, who are trying to reach stakeholders, you know, the investors, the media, uh, workforce, obviously employees are, is extremely important. Um, gen just general society, anyone online and, um, and the checkpoints, obviously there are, there are common themes between them, but there are also specific uh, content points which each stakeholder group will want to will want to know and want to look at. So we'll be covering the major themes that are obviously you know transferable across industries and stakeholders, but also go into you know specifically in more detail, you know what that stakeholder needs. Like what do you need to tell the journalist that um, you know you don't need to tell your employee and, and vice versa. So hopefully, yeah, it would be it'd be a useful useful time for everyone. So we're going to um, just just a quick uh, shout out. Uh, obviously, we've got all, all the materials. We've got our actual um, Connect IQ reports all available. You know, please go down, uh, download, go online and download the bundle. Obviously, is there any questions that you feel we weren't able to answer after this, or you just prefer a more sort of one to one catch up? You know, don't hesitate as well to you know, go on our website, send a note, um, you know, just say you want to speak to either one of us or perhaps it's a different, you know, different specialist in the organization. We'd be more than happy to obviously take, you know, this presentation, which is much broader and, and help personalize it to you. And as I say, help, help you, uh, help you in your journey, but please, you know, it's a good starting point. Please do come online and, and download the, uh, download the bundle. So, you know why so why are we why are we talking about this you know i mean lots of you will work for large com companies or work you know alongside uh, as clients of large companies where where pretty much everyone in the world will know of the brand names you know so you know why why do i need to tell a story even if i'm in that position and it's quite simple really you know if you're not telling your story and i'm sure most of you are aware of this if you're not telling your story someone else will and if someone else is using their own language and their own repertoire to communicate what your business does you're opening yourselves up to so many risks when you're trying to employ the best talent and and let's not forget you know there is a you know everyone is always after the best talent if you bring in the best talent you bring in you know the most, most diverse talent you know diversity breeds innovation you know innovation leads to you know quicker growth it leads to success so if you don't bring in if you don't win that that war on talent at the beginning you know you're you're already taking a backward step compared to your competitors. So when you're trying to attract the best talent, do you really want to, you know, leave your story, leave your, your culture, your values up to glass door or people leaving reviews? Perhaps you, you know, we've all hired um, people that weren't the right fit for the organization. We've all had to let people go. Um, would you really want that person owning your story on Glassdoor? So when you're, you know, on the cusp of hiring, you know, the next, you know, Steve Jobs into your business, you know, they're going to read this Glassdoor review and that one review is going to lose it. Do you want your sales team to have to, you know, fight against bad press? You know, when the sales team's out there, you know, close to closing a deal, do you really want them to have to deal with questions that are, you know, are brought up because someone else has told your story? You haven't owned your message to media, you know, your marketing team haven't owned the um that message about thought leadership and when it comes to investment you know again do you want to be on the front line you know communicating to investors about why you're such a you know a solid investment base or would you rather than read an article by a major publication about why you know you might be an overweight stock you know again you know, if you're not owning your story you're not telling it you're at risk of real um a real danger of losing out in value and what's the best way to tell a story to ensure that it resonates? The best way is to, to be authentic and you've got to build up trust. And if we look at the history of how we as humans, as um, a society have built trust, there has always been a face-to-face -face physical element to building trust. You know, when we talk about, you know, using email outreach or writing a letter or picking up the phone, usually all of those steps are, uh, are usually towards an end goal of setting up a meeting with someone. Usually when we build up a business relationship or a personal relationship with someone throughout history, it's been a, phys a physical moment, you know, a handshake or whatever cultural uh, medium it is, you know, why to, to build up that up. But ideally as humans, we, we thrive on body language. We thrive on eye to eye contact. You know, we have seen a shift in that slightly over the years. You know, we've got online dating platforms, for instance, um, to help you know, bridge that gap. But um, now more than ever, you know, um, with everything that's gone in 2020, is so much <laughs> has gone in 2020. Is, you know, our kids will be learning about it in the history books and we'll be sat there on a, a pop quiz, you know, 
you know, telling our grandkids, you know, what, what happened in the year 2020. Um, and after 2020, you know, how are we going to build up trust with our audience? You know, we can't, you know, some people are just not going to be willing to have, you know, a CEO go in and sit there, you know, in a one-on-one -on -one meeting situation because of all the risks associated with it. Or, or perhaps, you know, there's some um, issues relating to diversity and HR are going to be more sensitive in the future. There's just so many issues that could come up, you know. And so we're going to be relying more and more on the digital platform completing the full end-to-end -end system of introducing yourself as a company, introducing yourself as a brand, communicating those values, but then actually converting that into trust all through an online platform without the ability to, to set up the, the meeting. So how do we go about it? The first step is you've got to know your audience. You know, we at Investors Digital, we base everything on data and everything on understanding. You know, at the heart of everything that we do, you know, we, we never just go out to market and put a message. We never will just go into a client or a partner and, and tell them what to do. Everything we do is based on analysis. And fundamentally, that's what we should all be doing. You, you have to understand what we as your audience think about you. What do we know about you already? How have recent events uh, changed that? Obviously, extremely pertinent to 2020. Um, what information do we need? Where are we getting it from? That is essential uh, because that helps you find information and content gaps because if there's information I need that you're not giving me, I will go to a third party to get it. And if that third party doesn't happen to look upon your business favorably as a, you know, as a stakeholder, I'm, I'm not walking away with the message that, that you need me to to take the positive action required to, to meet your, your company's objectives. That's a risk. So think about how to then reach your audience. You have to be, you know, I think we're all cognizant of the fact that there is an excess of information right now. Um, the lack of physical engagement around the world, physical contact has meant that businesses have had to deal with us as consumers in a different way. They can no longer rely on us walking down our high street or getting to our car to drive to our local shopping mall to immerse ourselves in the brand, in the brand colors and the clothing in the store, in the coffee shop. You know, we, we're not being immersed in the physical presence. So they're having to engage with us digitally online. They're just throwing lots of information at us all the time. Um, that's why you have to really understand the data. You know, what, what does your audience need? Stop throwing stuff at them. Um, I know we're all guilty of it as companies. You know, we, we kind of go on this overload of, oh, we need to get more information out to them. You know, people are asking questions. Well, actually, it's better to think about what is the question they're asking and how to answer that? Because that's how you build trust rather than, you know, spam for want of a better word and make sure you use the formats and chan channels that your audience values you know i um i'm millennial i don't check my posts very regularly so when i do check my posts there's usually three weeks of posts stacked up high if you're trying to communicate with me do not send me a letter <laughs> okay it's going in the bin you know 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 your audience know know your channels um and that that will help you that will help you resonate um much more the big thing to notice, and obviously we're going to be going, starting with the headline stat of online being, you know, we are a digital company and we're here to talk about digital communications, is that during this time, um, and, and these stats were taken over COVID-19 because it's uh, during, uh, you know, the, the peak of it, because it was really interesting to see how the world changed in terms of information gathering and consumption. So 60% increase in online media consumption from users during that time, you know, so that really meant that the brands who were out there putting information out related to the pandemic, related to the economic changes that were going on, had an opportunity to increase their brand awareness by 60%, not by doing any additional marketing, but just by simply putting information out at a time when people were researching, which is obviously paramount. And it's just, it's just critical to show just how more important, more than ever, online and digital communications um, are gonna be moving forward. The other key point is global. We're not just relying on local geographic uh, news content anymore. So uh, BBC Worldwide, they actually saw an increase in 80% in um, global traffic in the month of March. And that's despite the fact that um, football, uh, soccer, wasn't, wasn't being played uh, in Europe at that time. And that's usually one of their biggest traffic growth points. So it just shows, again, people who perhaps were relying on social gatherings, uh, meeting up with friends, going to the workplace, uh, discussing news and current events and picking up information from their trusted physical sources, their, their peer group, they are now having to go out online and reach new global uh, media um, more than ever. So again, just showing the importance that digital has played during the last, the last few months and, and beyond. 
The other key point, I mentioned it earlier, is that we're being bombarded. 240 million daily spam email messages related to COVID-19 were sent out. And again, it just shows, you know, yes, okay, your users are online. Yes, they're searching, but don't, don't bombard them. You know, I've got, you know, I think in my personal Gmail account now from since this thing started about 14,000 unread emails, you know, it's, you know, that's tough. You know, you've got to, you've got to, uh, I mean, I sound pretty difficult to get hold of, right? You can't send me posts. You can't send me an email, <laughs> but, uh, you know, so it's text message. Um, but you know, um, you just got to really think about it again, just don't spam them. Just, just find the question that they're trying to, um, they want to know the answer to and direct it to that. Don't just throw lots of content at them. Our audience is being bombarded. We're being bombarded. But despite that, we're still searching. And it's really interesting to see here is that um, you can see how search um, trends change dramatically during an event. So there's a lot of information going on about um, general knowledge. Um, and then also during the COVID-19, obviously things moving from symptomatic to economic impact and government response now. So again, it's really critical for us to understand what people are searching for, because if you're starting to put out content now related to COVID-19 specifically, you might be missing the boat. You've got to move as your users move. And that's definitely what our Connect IQ report looks at, because we're constantly updating our criteria to say, well, if users are now looking for this type of content, that's what we'll score you on. And that's really important for, for all of us here as communications professionals. There's no point in putting content out late. You've got to put it out as people are, are moving with the times. And most importantly, what will they find when they search for you? So over 50% of website traffic comes from organic search. So make sure that your content is findable, it's relatable, um, and it's holding you in a good light. You know, Coming back to that original point, own your message. Don't let a third party own your message. If someone searched for you on Google, make sure they find you on page one. <laughs> Please don't let them find your competitor on page one or a scamming article or a bad glass door review. That will damage your reputation and what you're trying to achieve as a business. So what does this all mean? Essentially, to build trust, we all now need to, to think about that engagement in a different way. As I say, we can no longer rely on a BDR team to pick up and do a cold call or an email campaign to then look to set up a meeting. You've got to think about how do I build trust from initial brand information? We know people are searching online. It's a confusing time. People are being bombarded with information. So what content can you put out there that answers the questions that people have so people come to you, they immerse themselves in your brand and you build up that relationship. You've got to build up, you've got to build up that trust completely online. To do that, you first have to be visible. So make sure that if you have a story, there's no point in having the best story in the world if no one, if no one's going to see it. So be visible with the story. Get the content out there, be visible. Monitor your presence, you know, make sure that, you know, as I just mentioned, you're on page one on Google, that people can find your story. That's more, that's very important. What's just as important is when they find it, they can understand it. A lot of companies are guilty of just getting content out there quickly. And then, so you'll use your internal teams to write it, which is obviously fantastic. It might contain a lot of internal jargon or industry jargon, which may not uh, relate to everyone. So if you're looking to hire perhaps a college graduate, you know, you want some jargon in there because you'd want them to, you know, show and demonstrate they can understand a bit of it, but you don't want to include lots of internal jargon that might scare them away. Um, at the same time, you're talking to an investor, you want to use a different type of language. So just make sure that you're being very clear uh, and you're thinking about that audience uh, member, that stakeholder and what they need to be, you know, how they need to be communicated to. And that, and that brings us to though a global point that everyone is human and you need to humanize your content. So it doesn't matter, you know, whilst the, the language might change and the jargon might change the theme, should remain be human the best way to do that and we've seen some really good examples over the last few months you know is um put your leadership team on video get them out to market um get your c-suite uh, you know towing the company line in video format don't just put reams and reams of text big pdf documents up online you know really really engage with them and, and humanize that content it's the, the best way to build trust and that correlates to being creative you know again we all know, we've all seen the user research studies over the years that putting up long reams of text on the website does not work. People do not read it. People do not engage with it, you know? So, you know, be creative, you know, engage with them, find a way to cut through those normal barriers, be disruptive, be innovative, um, and really, really connect and, and build that trust with your audience. So, you know, so really, you know, 
just to summarize this this piece up over the next two slides is you know, people want information from from companies that they're looking to place their trust in you know and they build trust with with humans so you humanize your organization put your leadership team out there give them content that answers the questions that they need you know use all your digital channels your social media your website to really immerse them in your brand and build that level of trust because as we move forward, you know, into what the new norm is going to be, the companies that are going to succeed, the companies that are going to come out of it are the companies that have the trust and the backing of their investors. They have the trust and the backing of their employees, and they have the trust and the backing of their consumers, their customers. They're going to, you know, they're going to feel safe about coming and to do business. But more than that, you know, when you're talking about the socioeconomic factors, they're going to want to do business with you because of what your values and what your purpose stands for as an organization. And that is so important to ensure that your purpose and your values are constantly front and center. And during this time, you're not just talking about you know, bottom line numbers, you know, really talk about what you stand for as an organization, because that's what employees and customers are, are going to want to hear. And ultimately that will drive revenue and that will obviously help your investors. So how do we do all that? You know, we've obviously covered in some, some large themes. You know, I think the most important thing here is that, you know, ultimately it starts online. And um, with the Connect IQ report that we'll be going through now, we can, we can certainly hope to, you know, Rachel here can certainly help to, to showcase some of those points and bring to light, you know, what that content actually starts to look at. But um, hopefully that's a, a useful introduction to, to why Connect IQ is so important as we look to build trust online in, in these uncertain times. It's a good one. I have a question before we go go ahead, though. If yeah, I may. Diana, please. Um, it seems that an overarching theme, or the overarching theme of our discussion, is that having effective online communications is more important than ever at this moment. It's it's absolutely vital to a, a brand's ability to communicate. I don't say I can speak for everybody in our room, but <laughs> I imagine the question is a question is how do you create that? What does that mean? Right. And, um, and what are some of those best tips and tactics that the leaders are doing right? And how can we emulate that and model that? Um, I'm glad you asked, because we're about to get to the data portion of this entire okay, talk. Okay, the takeaway, so, all right, appreciate it. We'll show you all of that. And Luke, what I always find interesting is that on your end, on the strategy end, um, all of the data that we've uh, extrapolated up to this point really supports everything that you just said. And I'll show you just that. This is a study that was just recently published by McKinsey. And Diana, you mentioned effective digital communication. We've all seen bad digital communication. We've also seen effective digital communication, maybe just not known it. We've seen it from brands like Disney and Nike and others. And what McKinsey did is they ran a study. They found, okay, so what are some of those key three things that these leaders have in common that really sets them apart? Number one, it requires purpose. So you have to tell it, you have to tell that story of corporate purpose. It's all based on strong fact-based narrative, a bolstered with thought leadership, and even something that shows that you have corporate purpose that actually engages employees. What I think is most ironic is that McKinsey released this study just recently. This is what we at Investus Digital have been studying and analyzing on thousands of corporate websites for the past 10 years. So it's aligning really well, as you can tell. Um, it I, also requires I think you said that part of it, and I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I, I don't want to lose the thought that part of effective communications is that we may not know it. Right? Yes. Is that the emphasis of the subtlety or um, not because in your face, as they say? Exactly. It, it just, it works. It connects. Um, sometimes you might recognize it because you're like, wow, that message really got through or wow, I have not seen the CEO come out on social like that before. But in the same breath, I, I, you know, I think the subtleties when you do get effective communication and then you go about the rest of your day dealing with, um, you know, COVID quarantine or dealing with some of the civil unrest or some of the inclusivity stuff we've got going on in the U.S. That's when I think you also can know, hey, that was effective communication because that let you go on and about your day. All right, I'll let you go ahead, thank you. Yeah, well, no, that's a very good point too because what's funny is it's easier said than done. We always know that. It actually requires an infrastructure. And I hope if anyone's listening here, your PR and comms, you're a practitioner in-house or you're an agency, these three facets are just absolutely critical because so many times you'll come out of a strategy session, right? And you'll have, oh, we got the purpose. We got it. We're going to go save the world. Um, but you don't have the infrastructure to deliver it. 
you have literally cut yourself off at the knees and that strategy is going nowhere. So what McKinsey also pulled out was that infrastructure is just as critically important in indicating even five times that of uh, what makes a digital leader an effective communication. Namely, number one, digital tools. They will set you apart in the industry. Mapping external issues helps out as well too, and then quantifying those external issues. So figuring out, okay, we're right here with our audience. We need to get to here. How do we do that? And what are the metrics that show that we're making progress against that goal? The third thing that they found out is that it actually requires that you reach your audience, just like Luke says, if you have the best idea or communications in the world, if no one hears it, uh, it's just, it's toast, right? So you have to find this audience though today because they're not just sitting there waiting for you. And now our audiences are more diverse than they ever have been before. When previously in PR and comms, stakeholders were pretty easy, right? They were uh, business related. They were the C-suite. They were the board. They were shareholders. They were investors. They were the media. Now, add employees to that, add consumers to that, add potential recruiting talent to that as well, because now those people who are going to come to work for you care about your stance and all these things. Your consumers care about what your stance is on sustainability or even your reputational reliance. They care about this kind of stuff. So now your stakeholders that you thought were such a small niche group that were easy to control with some numbers and some charts and some up into the right bar graphs, are not the same and they require different ways of reaching out to them. That's why, and it's also, again, I could say kind of ironic, it's kind of the impetus behind what we call connected content, where when you look at it, really truly a well-oiled machine that is a communications function has these four facets. And just like the infinity symbol in the back, this thing should move like a well-oiled machine time and time again. You have a story, whether it's your purpose, your values, your mission, your inclusivity statement, you need to tell it. But then not only that, you need the infrastructure. So if you don't have it, you've got to build it or find a partner who can, but it needs maintenance and it needs 24 seven, 365 maintenance. Um, and then you need to be able to find those audiences too. So once you get this thing going, anything that comes your way, be it COVID or be it civil unrest, diversity, what have you, you now have the system where you can effectively tell that story build it, run it, and then make sure it finds its audience. So we know here's a good example. We've all been living through this for the past few months. Let's say that you had that ideal setup and that ideal system to where, oh, something like coronavirus hits. It's March, 2020. I will never forget that month for the rest of my life. And you realize, wow, the world is fundamentally changed. Your stakeholder groups are now diverse and they're dispersed. They're working from home, they're remote, they're distracted. Travel's restricted. You can't do in-person meetups. You can't take the C-suite on a road show anymore. And you certainly can't do press conferences. Business meetings are virtual. Effectiveness and productivity, you've even got to keep an eye on that. And social distancing, I'm not even going to say the new normal, but I just did. But I promise I won't say it again. So the question is essentially, are you going to be able to tell your story that's built and run on a reliable, secure platform and be rest assured that your audiences are going to find it. That's the kind of piece that you need to go to sleep at night, knowing that whatever you wake up to on the news tomorrow, you're gonna be okay. But then not only that, that you're building that trust through those channels and you're not just you know, responding reactively. Um, a great example of this too, you know, COVID's already a couple months past, even though we're still living it, it was Blackout Tuesday. Um, if you lived through this kind of like we did, you probably noticed that, wow, this thing came together literally with less than 24 hours to spare before the actual Blackout Tuesday happened. And to see a similar response on brands across the globe was phenomenal. You can see certain instances where the brand actually spoke out as Amazon and as Netflix and really talked about their stance, showing those audiences, whether they were consumers or employees or even the investors, that, hey, we stand with you guys. Sometimes, just like Luke said, they put the C-suite up in front. Letters from CEO, from CVS Health, um, from Procter & Gamble, from Merck, and some just went silent, which also was fine. Because at that point, this thing was 24 hours old and we were all still figuring out what to say and most importantly, certainly what not to say. So how well are companies actually using their 
corporate digital channels in uncertain times because we know one thing change is the only constant it is going to happen again something else is going to come up we're living in an election year it's going to get crazy so we took a look at this just to see how well certain corporations were set up to really respond to this i'm proud to say i think covid certainly taught many of us a lesson and many brands a lesson in hey we need to have our channels active and ready to respond to messages when the brand needs to respond, when the CEO needs to respond. In fact, we take a look at a select group of companies. We call them the NASDAQ 100, the NYSE 100, and the FTSE 100. FTSE, meaning most of the, the top 100 companies in the UK. What's interesting to note about this, I think context helps. FTSE, I, they, they lead the space in this stuff. We could all take a good look at our FTSE 100 ranking report and find most of the global leaders in the space that are leading the way of building trust, speaking um, authentically, and then even just showing that purpose and those values and building out that story. But okay, take it back a couple months. COVID hits, um, president declares a national state of emergency uh, right, right around March 14th. It took 10 more days for 40% of the NASDAQ 100 to activate at least two channels with their response on COVID. 14 days. This was like groundbreaking national emergency news. Um, I'm reassured to say that, hey, the FTSE was also kind of with us in that instance. Only 48% of the FTSE 100 had two or more channels activated. But I'm also happy to say that, you know, over time, come April 2nd, we took another look at the NICE again, even, they were at 94%. So I can say this, we did learn quickly, and it looks like it from some of the um, civil unrest and things that we've experienced in June um, that, you know, we're ramping up this response time and hopefully helping to build this trust step by step, like through science. And before I interrupt you, Rachel, I just, I, yeah. I'm, I just want to make sure we're talking about American companies and British companies, correct? Are there other global companies in your research? Correct, yes, we study tons of global companies. NASDAQ 100 would be anything in the US. Same thing with NYSE 100. FTSE 100 is almost exclusively limited to UK. Um, we have another report, the Global 100. That is truly global, no boundaries. Okay, and these are all public companies that are included in the report? All publicly traded companies and all listed on those indices. We also score privately held companies though, Diane, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, one of the things is true though, obviously public companies are held to a different standard, both from a compliance perspective, and then also they have far more stakeholders that, that uh, speak their mind. But then also um, one of the things we find is that corporate uh, private corporations, those that are bigger, understand that they can follow suit and respond and communicate with those audiences in the same way public companies can. So we can score both. We find the public companies, their feet are held to the fire a little bit. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for keeping me on my toes. Um, here's how some of them did it, like Vodafone uh, with a signpost, one of the easiest ways to get that message out there. And when consumers and employees are coming to you, boom, the first thing they see on your homepage, they know that you care, that you're human, that you're people, and that you're living this too. Um, many brands curated content, so content specifically about what they were doing with COVID or what other brands and other companies were doing with COVID, or even like T-Mobile's instance in this case, they, they even had a, a hub of, uh, of COVID content. Some of the stats that you see on here too are really truly same thing here where we are looking at how many of these companies by the end of our study had actually rolled out many of these tactics to build that trust. Again, we're in uncertain times. We need leaders to step forward, people that we can trust, people that we can rely on. This is a battleground for consumers, for employees, for investors and the like. Very timely too. So many brands like Merck were publishing very frequently, which is good. And they displayed that human side like Rolls Royce. I love this. They had employees video document their return from furlough. <laughs> and I love that they were pretty open about the fact that, hey, we can't get it right for everyone. There's gonna be a little hiccup when you come back to. So I like that. Most importantly, they knew the importance that it has to be visible. I was so pleased to see that 73% of the FTSE 100, again, UK companies, um, invested in social channels. They knew, hey, that is Twitter, especially, the best way to get that message to your audience, especially in times of crisis or when it has news behind it. So our research shows that yes, a lot has changed in a short time, but there's still a long way to go for many, for many companies. Um, the cool thing about our Connect IQ study is that that's exactly what it does because we know 
you can't manage what you can't measure. You certainly can't manage change. You can't manage a path to more trust and actually influencing sentiment of your stakeholders without measuring it. And that's exactly what Connect IQ does. One of the key things we know about it though is that you have to start with a trusted source of truth. You can't just kind of, you know, take a look, oh, you know, sentiment looks good today. I think we're, I think we're, I think we're doing all right. No, you definitely have to have the right tools in place and the right experience in place. A great example um, for us, for instance, we've been studying corporate websites on those criteria for 12 plus years and update them regularly now on a biannually basis. We have both tool enabled data and we have manual enabled data. Yes, manual. There are people that look at every single page of a website, not for things that might be taken subjectively, um, but for elements of, hey, do you have this? Do you not have that? Uh, was the CEO in this video? Was he not in this video? Stuff that even tools today really can't pick up, which is important that we have the human factor. We graded at least a thousand plus sites every single year, and we're tracking towards 2000 right now, we're only halfway through, and over 300 criteria in each one of those studies. So you can tell we're, um, we're keeping busy. Oh, here's what that report looks like. So if we were to run one specifically for any company in the world, um, they would get this. It's a one sheeter that both drills into select few of that 300 criteria. Uh, you didn't think I was actually going <laughs> to make you go through the whole 300 criteria. I appreciate that. We roll that up for you, even on this ad hoc custom report. We pull together things that really are going to be game changers in this day and age because we figure the score is really what's going to help set you apart. Everything from content mix to channel mix to optimization and amplification, really some key things that we saw that set any company apart from their competitors. Here's the best part. You can look at the back of this report and literally find anywhere that's grayed out is a competitive advantage, either for you or your, for, for your competitors. Um, but not all these criteria are created equal. That's why there's a score applied. And that's why you can see where we actually do have a rank and you can download it at that bit.ly link on the bottom of the screen or at the end of this presentation. We have ranking scores for all of the NICE 100, the NASDAQ 100, Global Health, and the FTSE 100 as well too, if you'd like that one, um, that really show you, okay, so who's doing it best from one to 100 and pretty soon out to 250 as well too when we finish our research. Uh, it's simply put I, I, I wanna ask you a question. We're, we're yeah. looking at these great cases, great examples, big companies, what they're doing. But what is sort of for, for our listening uh, audience who's here to learn, what, what's the takeaway? What do they do next? Ah, I, you can tell I love takeaways. So I built those in. The key takeaway is a go, go request one of these ad hoc custom assessments. It will tell you everything you want to know about yourself and for select competitors. So thank you, Diana. Take that one. Take that one away. That is the key takeaway. But let's also back that up a step. Um, obviously, Luke has shown you uh, what's important, what's resonating right now. And what we, in talking to 1,600 plus companies globally, what we really see is starting to set them apart. It's trust its purpose, its authenticity. But how do you get there, right? It's not just building up that connected content model of a system that will help you deploy that message, but it's actually just as much what's baked into that message as well. And that's what we have in here. And we break it down into five categories. Number one, you have to measure the narrative. And by doing that and measuring your narrative, potentially even getting a custom assessment, what you get back is where you can actually say, okay, we're here, we need to grow to here. Here are literally 10, 15, 20, 30 different things we can put into our site, into our communication protocol that will help us get there. In fact, Diana, you'd love this one. Some of our clients even bake their bonuses on how they score and how they rank in the Connect IQ. Um, it's a great way to do it because you can literally have such a crystal clear path to, hey, where we were, where we need to be, and the steps we're taking, and hey, our score is increasing. So That's I'll right. show you That's that. the power of it, or as, as leads see the power of it, so. Yeah, exactly. And for, you know, if you're PR and comms, both practitioner side or agency side, we help agencies with this stuff all the time, especially for their clients who are trying to figure out broad spectrum. We need a complementary research engine to handle this. 
um, how can we you know, partner with you guys to help get the job done? So let me show you, and this will actually literally leave you with a few ideas of ways that you can either implement this on your own, or we can pinpoint, just like you saw in that Connect IQ report, exactly where you need to go to, to improve. So narrative, are you telling the story that your audiences need to hear? Um, it's broken down by a couple things, and I'll try to keep it fast, but um, it's broken down by strategy, business model, uh, what we do, the market environment. For instance, I love this stat from all of our research. I love to pick on the Macy 100 because they do a really good job, but, um, but they're, you know, they're getting better year and year um, that we make this study. For instance, only 14% of companies in the Macy 100 explain their strategy, their business strategy. Um, certainly this report, you know, you have to take into consideration there may be certain businesses that maybe shouldn't share their strategy because it's a very competitive marketplace. But then think about all of the investors and the very smart talent that want to work for you that don't know where you're headed either. That's a problem. Um, only 4% of those actually quantified those ambitions. So you can look at this two ways. Wow. Are we in that mix? Download the report, you can find out if you are. But better yet, wow, we don't quantify our stuff either. That's a huge competitive advantage because you know most of the people in the NICE 100 do not. Here's what that looks like, or here are a couple of takeaways that you could actually implement to show that and to get that done. Corporate video like AstraZeneca, they have so many videos from the C-suite to employees to major subject and industry area leaders, Anglo-American, um, has an excellent one as well too. Um, strategy and visualizing that strategy. Two great examples on the screen, even right there. Coca-Cola, I love how they did it too. And Heineken, they realized that, hey, people aren't gonna read all this text. We've gotta make this visual if we want people to understand our strategy is in line with where they want to work, where they want to spend their money and where they want to invest. Um, business model. Great way to put more information there, the breakdowns and how that, um, how that all works with even all of your different market areas. Sustainability, another big piece of your narrative is not just telling people, hey, by the way, here's who we are, but also here's our stance on sustainability and how we're making the environment better for you and your children. That kind of matters too. So again, a great competitive opportunity here. Um, only 28% of companies in the NICE 100 discuss their sustainability strategy. Why is that, Rach? Well, I'll tell you exactly why. Um, it's definitely not necessarily the norm in the US. In the UK for the FTSE 100, it's an alarmingly higher rate. So one of the things I think, Luke, you could definitely speak to this, we've seen over the past 10 and 15 years is that these trends start in the UK and trickle over to the US. You guys know GDPR, you guys know um, PECR, hopefully. So you know that these, what sometimes become regulations, when the world is on a global scale, and we do business globally, you've got to adhere to the bottom common denominator standard and that's data privacy in that place. And now hopefully soon sustainability too. I definitely I, think I, after COVID we will. Yeah, I mean, before, yeah, I agree. I mean, I just want to say on that point before, before um, obviously 2020 came about, you know, sustainability was a key um, agenda, a key topic in all the research, you know, for investor relations professionals, for corporate communications professionals, for the C-suite. It wasn't just about, you know, um, are we doing good things for the planet? It was more than that. You know, it's human capital. What are we doing for, you know, local charities? How are we helping mm -hmm. out, you know, local areas that we operate in, you know, and ultimately just proving to people that they're investing in a company that's doing more than just turning a profit. They're working for a company that's turning more than a profit. And it's going to be more than just um, sort of a tick box exercise, which I think a lot of clients viewed it previously. And now, you know, following COVID and, and um, everything that's going on in the world today, it's going to be more important because people are going to want to be able to tell their friends, especially Gen Z, the research shows us, mm -hmm. they want to tell their friends, you know, I work for a company that does this great stuff. They're going to be using language less like, hey, I work for a company and they've given me a six figure salary out of the box. They don't, that's, that's, le that's less important on their agenda. What's more important to them is I'm working for a company and we're changing the world. You know, we're making cars electrical, you know, we're doing some great stuff. You know, mm -hmm. you look at Elon Musk and Tesla and how much they're in the press. And, you know, you speak to that younger generation, they all know Elon Musk, you know, they all know the, their, their child's new name, you know, and that's because you ask them who the CEO of Ford is, they may not know now, right? Because to them, you know, Ford's like old hat, you know, yeah, you might earn more money working for Ford. I don't, you know, I don't know, but they don't care. They want to work for a company that's changing the world. And the only way to do that is to talk about your 
sustainability potential. So it's more than just, hey, we're like low carbon emissions, you know, think really about how you as a company and what you are doing as a company is changing the world and shaping the world that they live in because that that is what's most important to them. And that will resonate into when they control investment funds. That will resonate into when they become buyers at a consumer level or at a, in a business level, you know, when they become the purchasing directors, you know. So get, get out there early, you know. 28% are doing it. That means you can get ahead of the 62% of your, uh, of your competitors. You're a pretty good shot at, at nailing yeah. that one. Yeah. I even love our client to beers, how they, because I mean, everyone's sustainability story is different, right? Whether you're changing the world or you're impacting local communities, you're building gardens, you're going um, carbon net neutral. But like with De Beers, where they're literally moving an entire herd of wild animals in Africa and then returning them back into their environment and how they're going about that in such a careful way and helping to tell that story. No one knows about that story. They only know Leonardo DiCaprio and Blood Diamonds. And so we I obviously had to work very hard to try to show, hey, look, this company is up to a lot of good. So great. Here's how a couple others did it, Unilever. Um, Unilever, I love this too, because they literally connected the dots between purpose and action and actually with their sustainability strategy. So how does that fuel us to actually drive our purpose and why you should join our cause? Because I'd imagine, you know, Unilever is definitely a very interesting company to work for. Maybe not the first one that most Gen Z um, or millennials would want to, but then they connect the dots and they're like, oh, I see the bigger picture. I can help the world. Same thing with stakeholder engagement. You know, um, clients like RBS know that their stakeholders are so diverse now. They are consumers, they're clients, they're investors, they're the media, they're influencers. Um, and how do they take their perspective into consideration? Um, materiality assessment, another big one that is not so prevalent in the United States, but essentially taking a look, opening your doors, being transparent from a business standpoint and saying, hey, look, we have all of these risk factors. Here's how we're addressing them. Because if you think that people don't know what your risk factors are, you probably need to think again. Uh, that leads us to reputational resilience. How resilient is your reputation, especially online, when it can honestly, one bad piece of press um, a couple bad links or a bad glass door review can really, really hurt your efforts. 35% of companies in the NICE explain their purpose, vision, and mission. That's great. That means the other 65%, hey, there's your competitive opportunity. Um, and also, you know, similar to that, 39% describe their innovation initiatives. So again, like if you want to get out there, tell them what you're doing to innovate. Tell them and explain your purpose, vision, and mission and make it visual like these guys. Yeah, I was gonna say, I mean, I've lost track over the last 10 years. Obviously I've been working with clients where, you know, a, a news article come out, a piece of content that they haven't owned, you know, third party has come out and it's hurt them. It's hurt their share price. It's hurt their, for their leadership's bonuses. It's hurt their recruitment efforts. And they sit there in a meeting, they go, but, but it's, it's not true or yeah, but if it is true, it's just one small part of a large component. And I say, yeah, but you haven't been proactive in telling people about the positivity. So you've got a negative piece of content hitting a neutral reputation. There's only one way it's going to go down. But if you've got a plus 10 positive reputation and this piece of content is going to knock you down to, guess what? You're still plus eight. You know, you're going to weather that storm. It's going to have a less impact on your share value. It's going to impact your leadership team less. It's going to be less of a headache for you. Um, and that's the thing. So it's all about telling your story before anyone else does and, and owning it. And owning the search space. Yeah. Um, same thing here. More great examples, stuff that you could literally take away, implement in your communications plan right now, whether it is for a publicly traded company or for a private company. Um, even consumers want to know, hey, how is this private company embracing um, the digital transformation out there? Especially if you're, if you're in the manufacturing industry which many are even private there, uh, they, people want to know, employees want to know, am I going to be working at a digital laggard or am I going to be working at a place that's actually trying to shape the future? Next category, content mix. Um, essentially, are you using the right formats? Kind of like what I spoke to. If you want to get through to Luke, we all know you have to send him texts, probably some gifts, maybe a couple of videos as well, or reach out to him on his video gaming console. Uh, for me, <laughs> If you want to reach me, you definitely need to text me or maybe hit me up on Instagram at the same time. Maybe catch me on Twitter on a rare moment. Um, it's all about finding that right content mix for that right audience. One way we know to do that is for different audiences, like for investors. And I'll go through this stuff fast, but here's a huge missed opportunity. People love video. You're watching a video right now. People love video, especially when they want to see a confident C-suite. 
that is here to present the future of a company coming back and bouncing back from COVID. They want to see that. You got to do video for that kind of stuff. Um, a lot of our, both the, the companies that we work with and even just the companies that we assess do that. They do that with their investment case. They do that with either film statements or interviews, even the vision, the vision for the future. And they really, they make this content easy to consume and easy to understand. Because I think at the end of the day too, they, they want it to not just go out for investors. They know that employees care about their investment por portfolio and their profile. And employees care, is this company gonna be around in six more months? Will I have a job? So they realize this stuff is cross-contaminating to other audiences. Annual reports, I mean, with ESEF going on over in the EU, it's only a matter of time before um, in the States, they require the same thing with XHTML annual reports. Um, same thing with video webcasts. And, you know, show major shareholders. We're all used to um, some of those great shareholders like Uncle, Uncle Carl, Icon is our favorite <laughs> But, you know, does this have a really good diverse shareholder mix? Is a lot of it institutional or is a lot of it, you know, independent personal investors, which actually, you know, would resonate with a lot of Gen Z. How do you structure your capital structure and debt? And are you open about that as well? Heineken and Vodafone are very clearly. For the media, what are you giving the media? Um, and are you making a journalist's job easy? Can they easily find stats, your position, your vision, your mission, your purpose, your future, when they come and look for it, when they see a really damaging case for you out about COVID. Only 17% of companies in the NICE 100 publish research. I can understand that we're not all research organizations, um, but luckily a bit more, 43%, do provide some level of thought leadership. That's one thing that I think anybody can put out there. Like that thought leadership. And both context and prominence from BP, Anglo-American. Um, research sharing, like, are you very open and, and do you make your research very easy to find? Vodafone definitely does. And then for job seekers too, are you giving them the information that they're looking for? They, job seekers these days are so used to so much being on even ATS systems that if you don't have one and use it at full capacity, well, you know what, you join the 51% of the NIC 100 that don't either, but know that talent, the best talent is definitely going to expect more from you. Same thing like with Rolls-Royce, another great story on how they attract talent, even with gaming. And other role descriptions, you know, when you go online, can you find a role in a job at a major corporation that maybe fits your profile? Unilever tells you exactly what might be the best role for you, kind of like high school counselor-ish. Um, I love these sayings. You guys have heard this one. That's what means we have to do channel mix. We have to study channel mix. Our third category, and I am watching the time, so these are really fast, I promise. Essentially, are you engaging the audiences where you are? Are you reaching out to Luke on his video games? Are you reaching out to me on Instagram? Um, what's interesting is that most companies are doing a decent job at this. Way to go, nice 100. 77% are on Twitter, 73% are using LinkedIn. Um, but what's interesting is they don't see what's coming up on the side, and that's Instagram. Despite its popularity and its ease of use and its targeting capability, only 55% are using it. And then there's this one too. <laughs> Build it, they will come. Common misnomer and, and just kind of an outright lie that I think we believe in the digital space because we know you have to build it for them to come even when it comes down to a website, but even that's not it. So optimization, that's the fourth category. This looks at everything from SEO, desktop speed, mobile speed, where interestingly enough, most people fall short with mobile speed and links. If you're in the room, your PR comms, and you, aren't, you don't have an active SEO partner or someone like us that can do content and SEO at the same time, this is definitely something that no matter how many links you build, if you have bad spammy links, they will still continue to hold you back. But you know what, you can always get there with promotion. We always say any investment in content, because we know that's a big investment, should be equally matched to make sure that it's found. Otherwise it's gonna sit in a vacuum. That's our last category, amplification. So are you reaching, are you getting through to that right audience? What I thought was promising, but again, another competitive opportunity, 41% of companies in the NIC 100 have increased their paid search spend in the past two years. It's good. They realize you have to pay to get your message through sometimes or protect your space. However, only 38% of them are actively using Facebook. Facebook is a pay to play and it's a great traffic driver. 
and yet only 38% are actively using it. So that is it. I think I left you, Diana, enough time for questions, but simply put, um, this, you came here for the new digital standard checklist, and in under an hour, you got what was the highlights of all of those 300 criteria. It does make up that actionable roadmap for corporate websites. So yeah. That was fabulous. Uh, so packed with information, but um, want, we have a few minutes left. I'm wondering if anybody out there has questions, feel free to submit them via chat. Um, we are waiting. Uh, in the meantime, though, you mentioned again that people may be sitting on questions. They may come to them afterward after they digest all this and they certainly can get in touch with you or download the information, correct? Absolutely. Yeah, if you go to that bit.ly link or you can email Luke and myself direct, but remember he doesn't do email, so. <laughs> well, <laughs> work email, maybe, work maybe email I do. Yeah. Throw things at his pay, window they, or something. They, they <laughs> pay me to answer my work email, so I do answer that one. <laughs> <laughs> <That's> <laughs> my, 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 my Gmail, no. But, you know, it, it is a lot of information and obviously it's very broad. So, you know, but ultimately if you're sat there thinking, you know, how, how do we do it? You know, you know, Rachel touched on it, you know, it all starts with uh, the research, right, the data and, you know, knowing your audience. And that's exactly what this report is. You know, it's a, it's a quick way to get a very accurate understanding of what your audience want. And, uh, and then a very, in addition to that benefit, a checklist to say, what are your content gaps? You know, it's a good starting point. So, you know, do reach out to us, you know, obviously our contact details are here. You can, you can come through the website and we can set up a more you know, personalized uh, chat and really understand what it is that you're doing. Um, because it is a lot of information. We, we do appreciate that and we appreciate everyone's time. Um, you know, we talked about information overload throughout this, uh, <laughs> throughout mm -hmm. this, but, um, you know, hopefully, hopefully we've given you answered the questions that you had. And uh, just a reminder that everybody who's participating will get a recording, a, a, a link to a recording in an email. So um, you can watch this all over again. We're contacting Rachel and Luke. So um, thank you all for participating. Thank you, Rachel and Luke, for um, your presentation and for working with us. And yeah, I thank you have very much. a lot to go on here, and I'm sure you'll be hearing more. Sounds good. Okay. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.